Hello, everyone. Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> How is it going for this last panel? Good? Cool. We're going to talk about the future of governance. So I'm really pleased to welcome my three guests today. And what we're going to talk about is basically, OK, how do you apply the cooperative principles? So let's say reclaiming ownership of data, the value created, uh, the power we have, the decision making. How do we apply these principles in today's organizations, knowing that we are in a digital collaborative world? That's basically the question we're going to address. So let me introduce you to Nathan Schneider, right here. He is a writer and activist, and he's the initiator of the platform co-op movement. And uh, he gave a talk this morning about it. Um, let me introduce now Yassir Fischteli. He's the director of external relations and a member of the executive board at Group Up, which is, okay, let's describe it, a um, large workers co-op, which basically issues special payment means. Okay, is that clear enough? And finally, we have Marc-David Choucroun, co-founder of Food Assembly, which is a network that a lot of French people know by now, uh, a network, a platform that allows users to access uh, locally produced food through a distributed network of basically enabling hosts. Okay? So let me start right now by uh, the main question that I'd like to, to ask Nathan. Nathan, how do you explain the overall attention to governance issues right now and the platform co-op movement that you've been launching. How do you explain that? What, what's that all about, really? Well, thank you, uh, Marguerite, and, and thank you also to the We Share organizers, including you, for uh, including this conversation uh, in, this, in this event. Um, for me, the, uh, the interest around platform cooperativism uh, comes from two directions, at least in my own experience. The first is from the disrupted, right? Our conversations really emerge out of um, engagement with people who are feeling the effects of the platform economy, who are uh, uh, pushed into it often without necessarily choosing to. Uh, people like domestic workers in Brooklyn, um, uh, uh, people like uh, home health aides in the Bay Area, uh, people who, whose work uh, is, is experiencing the disruption of shifting economies and who are also seeing their standards go down. And so these people have been organizing and trying to figure out how they can have some kind of say in how these platforms are being run that are affecting their li lives and work. On the other hand, there are people who got excited about the idea of a sharing economy. Maybe they came to WeShare Maybe they went to somewhere else. Uh, maybe they started hosting on Airbnb. This idea of sharing resources, of, of um, co-creating an economy, was exciting to them, and still is. Um, in many ways, it's possible. But they start running into constraints of the system. They start uh, uh, having to operate according to the rules that the platform sets. And it's often very opaque how those rules are determined and who's making them and to what ends. And so the, the, the hope with this idea of platform cooperativism, cooperativism is not merely to have a really long word that's hard to say, um, or just to combine this question of online platforms and cooperatives, but to just open up broader questions about ownership and governance in online platforms that I think has, um, has been uh, forestalled uh, until recently. Thanks for that. Do you have any reactions? Yes, yes, yeah. You have a, yeah. yeah. <coughs> uh, I, I can't start without saying that you're doing Marguerite and the whole co uh, Wish Our community an amazing job. So thank you. I'm really proud to, to be here. Uh, in my opinion, uh, we are in, uh, in the middle of a, of a crisis, uh, which is a particular moment where uh, you know what is dying without uh, having a clear view of um, the emerging world. Um, so that's also the case for the sharing economy, I think, because it goes from extractive platforms uh, to other models like uh, cooperatives, um, from just uh, marketing uh, to real new business models. And uh, I feel that uh, 
entrepreneurs um, are uh, realizing that they can change the world, but the question is how. Uh, and um, uh, so, and the fact with sharing, if, uh, the thing with sharing economy is that you obviously have to share something. So the question of the property is uh, essential to my mind. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, hello. So I'm going to go back quickly about uh, La Ruche history and why we started at a, as a tech companies, why we raise money and why we're thinking about we need to, to share governance and uh, equity. So wh when we started... Uh, that was the, the next question, uh, but it's okay, question. you can go ahead. <laughs> sorry, I'm always ahead. So. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Okay. So wh when we started La Ruche, we, we wanted to uh, mostly uh, support uh, local farmers in order to support, help them to sell their food directly to people. So that was what we wanted to do and to bring good food to consumers and to make that happen uh, we developed that model relying on a local food community and on the uh, local host uh, that we really empowered to do uh, everything by himself. And we, we didn't really think at that point that we were going to build it as a cooperative because to, in order to make that work, we had to build a, a technology company. We had to build a, a, a startup. And to, in order to do that, we had to raise capital. And you couldn't go in the cooperative world and raise capital uh, like that with uh, such a model. Also, how can you raise capital from a community uh, when you don't have yet a, a community? So we had to show first that our idea was working. So that's why we started with raising capital. Uh, not that much, but depending this way on uh, venture capitalists and uh, starting as, as a commercial company. But pretty quickly we realized that uh, we were very close from our community and that uh, our service was nothing uh, with the community host and that we, we had to uh, involve them in the decision making, the evolution uh, of the rules of uh, uh, the platform. And very quickly we involved them in, uh, in setting up the rules, in deciding the rules of the, of the platform. Um, but we realized at one point maybe we were not going far enough and we were still like relying on a and capital and the decision were made mostly by the board, uh, including shareholders and the people. And we even think about like, uh, it was two years ago, um, and it was the beginning of the discussion about the platform cooperativism. It's like, should we uh, go back to a cooperative structure? Uh, should we do it? Uh, we didn't have raised that much capital yet. Also, we were a very hybrid company. The way we, we developed the company was between a tech startup as a, and a social enterprise. We had uh, uh, what we call in French the uh, uh, label, l'agrément ESS, agreement uh, for so being a social enterprise. So from the beginning, we were having this, uh, these values, like um, not thinking all, all only about economical impact, but also about the, the social and environmental impact. So we really think about, can we go back to a cooperative? It was like almost impossible. We realized like we couldn't do it. We already started the history of the company and started as a commercial venture. And at the moment, like the people investing in a company, uh, they want to, uh, to, have a, to make a, you know, a multiple on the money they invested in, in your company. So, okay, maybe we should, we should stop there and just continue to grow slowly. And then we say, okay, but if we, if we continue to grow slowly, we're gonna develop the model very slowly as well and we're not gonna be able to have an impact. And we started like the project with a big mission. We want to change the food system. We are still very small compared like, to the entire food system. So like, we're not gonna see like, big corporations like uh, Amazon or uh, big supermarkets in France like Auchan or Carrefour just do it and like, being on the side. So we say, okay, we need to raise capital. Let's raise capital again. Last year we decided to raise capital again. But we, we said to ourselves, okay, let's be clear with the new VC coming to the company. Let's tell them from the beginning what are our plans, what we think is gonna be the good outcome in order to develop the company. So when we're starting to look for new capital in the beginning of 2015, we said to every investor, okay, our plan is to, at one point, share equity with the network, share the governance. And the outcome we see, the exit we see for the company is not to do an IPO, is not to sell the company to, somewhere else, to someone else. It's maybe to find uh, evergreen partners, like I said uh, in the previous pa pa uh, panel, or maybe to find like uh, um, being able to have the community buy back some shares 
uh, from the investors. So we found people that were agreeing on, on that vision. And investors that can understand they're going to be there for the very long term, you know, maybe 7, 10 years, 15 years. Because also we, you cannot like make this kind of decision if you're only there for, for three uh, or five years, as was most uh, people are doing. So, <laughs> sorry, I'm pretty long, but no, telling no, the story. Fine. I was just going <laughs> to ask you, in practice, how does it go? How do you share uh, yeah. capital and power yeah. within your organization without being a co-op? Yeah. So, we raised capital, raised 8 million euros at, at that point, and uh, uh, last year we were like, uh, okay, it's, okay, now we have the capital night, we need to find a way to share uh, equity with the network, and we started to to study what was possible. Can we give uh, equity for free uh, to the people from our network? Uh, and we realized we, we could not, because you can give like uh, stock options for free uh, to uh, your employees, but you cannot do that with uh, the people working uh, for your network. Maybe also a question, are they really, uh, wor uh, are they really uh, independent people? Uh, are they uh, real entrepreneurs or are they workers? Something also really interesting. And, when you start thinking about sharing governance and sharing equity in a way that you don't see people as only workers, you see them uh, as real partners, real entrepreneurs. I think maybe company like uh, really big company like Uber, they don't have the same question because in a way they know it's just a temporary thing before replacing them with, uh, with machines. So they, and they should be workers in a way, they shouldn't be entrepreneurs. On our side, like we really feel they're entrepreneurs. So we start thinking, what can we do to share equity with the network? And we see we couldn't do that for free. So at one point, maybe we'll start a process of doing crowd equity in order to share the equity with the, with the network. So right now, we study the whole field with uh, another, another bunch of companies, and we have some solutions. But we don't want to start uh, to deploy these solutions without involving the network. And that's why. Uh, that's where you know uh, sharing governance and sharing equity are very close. So we decided in January that okay, let's start to prepare to create a, a new body of governance of the network that's going to work together in order to define the new rules and maybe the new uh, decision we're going to make in order to share equity or maybe uh, to share uh, uh, to give. Um, more support in terms of uh, training, in terms of rights, in terms of uh, uh, social security to the people from the network. So we started to prepare a, a program that we call the, um, the spokesperson of the network. And the network today has voted for 20 people that we're going to reunite, meet uh, in June for the first time. And we get, we're going to present them what we want to do to share equity with them to see if we have their support. Maybe we won't have their support. Maybe they don't want to be long-term partners and it's just our ID. Maybe they just want more rights or more commission, you know. But I think they, they do want. And, and also we're going to talk with them, how can we make the governance uh, uh, evolving? Because um, what is also very complex in a sharing economy platform is that at one point people go with your service and if you want to change anything, people won't be happy about it. But in order to evolve and not to get disrupted, you also need to change the rules. So you have two ways of doing it. Either you do it the Uber way, so you decide, you don't care, you have 20,000 uh, drivers or even more uh, worldwide. If they're okay with that, that's fine. If they're not, they will be kicked out of the system. Either you say, okay, I'm going to do it with my community. And that's why we try to do, we try to say, okay, we need to have the rules, the regulations of our platform evolving because right now we are too limited. But any time we want to change something, we see people disagree. So we need to do that with the network. So that's why we need to share also uh, governance and not only sharing uh, equity with a network. Thanks, Mark David. Uh, turning to the experience of Group Up, um, Group Up's parent company is set up as a workers' co-op, but it has workers everywhere in the world, and uh, the international presence is growing. So how do you deal with that? Um, well, we, we had um, a, a French workers' um, cooperative uh, at the beginning. Then we became something like uh, an international hybrid group. And uh, today we are uh, trying to set up uh, an international process uh, in order to strengthen um, the co-op or its values. We still don't know. Uh, I mean, we went through different stages in our history from the French co-op created in the mid-60s uh, 
by some trade unionists. It's really important in our history. To the current group with 3,000 uh, employees in 18 countries, uh, from uh, Istanbul to Sao Paulo, Bratislava, uh, delivering prepaid corporate services. Uh, at the beginning, the situation was uh, pretty clear. Uh, one product called Le Chèque Déjeuner, the paper-based uh, meal voucher, um, in one country, La France, <laughs> by one cooperative, uh, with strong principle. Every employee has the right to become co-owner. Uh, in fact, uh, it's not a right, it's a duty, because it's uh, mandatory uh, today. 45% uh, of the, uh, the profit is uh, shared on an equal basis. Uh, the financial reserves cannot be shared, which leads to uh, something like a non-speculative vision of the company. And our uh, strategic guidelines are voted on a one-person, one-vote uh, principle. And uh, the board is also elected uh, by and among the employees um, every four years. Well, you understand, because of our story, that the, the political vision, the political project was really strong since uh, the beginning. Um, then, at the end of the 80s, uh, the co-op decided to continue its development through uh, diversification, uh, but also uh, through external growth operations uh, in order to reach the international uh, level, uh, level. That's how the, the hybrid model uh, grew up. We, we now understand that it was a, a, a key of uh, our success because if we were not a co-op, we would have been bought by our competitors a long time ago. Uh, in fact, our co-op status uh, was a, a guarantee for us uh, for durability of the company and also commitment uh, of the, the co-owners because when it's your own company, I think that... Um, you, you want it to succeed uh, in a long-term view. At this time, uh, I, I have to admit that we were uh, a bit uh, obsessed uh, about our size uh, because we were thinking at this time, um, nobody loves us. We're too big for the small and too small for the big. Uh, but we realized that uh, this issue, uh, the issue was not um, clearly that one, because the question was not uh, to know if we were big or small, but to be fast uh, in reality. Today, uh, we are in the digital age, with tech disruptions and so on, uh, but we don't consider that uh, only as a, a, tech, um, a tech thing. Uh, we, we feel that it's an economical and social transformation, and our cooperative status, um, able to share values, strategic decisions, creating, we feel, confidence with our stakeholders, uh, appears as a competitive advantage we want to strengthen. So, uh, after debates within the General Assembly, the French Gen General Assembly, uh, we decided two years ago to study all different possibilities in order to as associate all the employees uh, to the capital and to strategic decisions wherever they work. At the French level, first, we enlarged the co-op by merging and absorbing three of our subsidiaries, do doubling the size of the co-op. Uh, we are now more than um, 700 co-owners and it's still a challenge because having shares and rights uh, is of course uh, essential in our model, but it's not really enough to create a, a real democratic uh, community. At the European level, and it's really important for us, we created, with the support of the European Trade Union Confederation, uh, a European Works Council. Uh, dedicated to the information and the consultation of our EU employees. 
uh, it was at this time, to f it was the first time and perhaps the, the unique uh, agreement signed by a company in Europe on a voluntary basis because it was really important for us to associate um, our employees uh, at that point. At the international level, we are now working on the specific uh, framework based on the three different pillars, uh, social, governance, of course, but also financial, that will be deployed step by step in the next uh, two years. The fact is that we want to spread practices, uh, practices based on cooperative principles, and uh, I hope we, we shall uh, succeed. Yeah, thanks. I, I think I'd like to highlight two key things that, uh, in what you said yesterday that are really interesting, I think. One is the v added value of being a co-op, and I think that's kind of an interesting lesson for the entrepreneurs among us. There is an added value in being um, set up as a co-op, uh, durability, engagement of workers or the other stakeholder that's part of the cooperative, um, and independence from competitors is something you highlighted, and that's very important for us to, to remember. And a second thing that I think um, comes out of what you two said is that, interestingly enough, you see a convergence between a big, large co-op that's becoming a hybrid model, as you said, and a small, well, not that small anymore, startup that's also experimenting with new ways of doing, you know, uh, implementing cooperative principles today, but without being a co-op. So there's kind of a convergence here in experimentations. I'd like to have Nathan per perhaps react first, if you have something to say. If not, it's okay. Well, I think at this point, these these hybrid models are are really important and really interesting. Uh, for instance, uh, one thing that we've seen in the in the U.S. happening is is uh, unions, trade unions, that are seeing their numbers decline, are looking to co-ops as uh, as an alternative model and they're getting in some cases very excited about this and and one model for instance that they're pursuing is is um, uh, organizing a, a, a platform co-op with a group of, of um, uh, nurses a certain category of nurses that are seeing their their regular hospital work decline uh, the, the labor pool on the one hand is a cooperative and the platform is structured more like a VC funded company um, and these kinds of these kinds of um, uh, hybrid strategies, I think, are going to be really important uh, for experimenting and building viable models in a context, especially where the uh, the cooperative e ecosystem uh, is still very limited. And I think it's really important to emphasize that ecosystem. I mean, this stuff isn't new, right? Um, Co-ops have come and gone. Uh, for many decades and, and in some cases centuries. And in, and in each case, they've had to build their own infrastructure. In places where cooperative enterprise has taken hold, they've also had to build appropriate financial tools, even appro appropriate educational tools uh, to, to equip uh, 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 managers with the, the, the tools that they'll need to, uh, uh, to practice democratic management. And so I think at this moment, it's especially important that we be willing to embrace hybrid forms, experiment with strategies for, um, uh, uh, for working with some of the elements of the existing system, but also to develop these new tools and to fill out the ecosystem. I think also there are two strategies that we need to uh, uh, highlight in uh, developing uh, strong cooperative uh, enterprises. One is the startup, right? Uh, starting from scratch, uh, building a cooperative, maybe uh, using the, uh, the, a competitive advantage of crowdfunding, drawing a community together and engaging, um, using the cooperative model as a way of getting a lot of strong early investment and engagement, not just um, some of the kind of light touch uh, engagement that existing crowdfunding models tend to offer, uh, but something deeper that comes with co-ownership and co-governance. On the other hand, there's the, there's the challenge of conversion, you know, which is taking businesses that have uh, been built up in different ways, um, and as we recognize that there's a com an engaged community of stakeholders and people to whom the business should be accountable, uh, that we find tools for, uh, uh, for converting them into more cooperative structures. And this is something that the online cooperative movement is doing quite a bit of right now, is uh, lots, of, for instance, baby boomer businesses are uh, facing, uh, uh, facing 
uh, uh, kind of extinction as uh, their owners uh, move into retirement. Uh, uh, some co-op developers are looking to strategies to convert them into worker ownership, transferring the ownership to the workers. And that involves financing, that ingo involves legal tools. Uh, uh, it also involves education and building a culture, you know, as you said, uh, of, of shared ownership, which, is, which can be quite different uh, from a culture of being an employee. So you're talking about converting uh, classic companies into co-ops, right? That's right, yeah. Not, not specifically platforms. Because right. I was gonna, I was gonna say. So, are you, are we gonna transform Uber into a co-op tomorrow? Well, I think that's an interesting question. On the one hand, I mean, it, it's, it seems to make some particular sense with, with platforms, because the, the platform business, so to speak, has tended to be one in which it's very high risk. There's lots of, there's a very high rate of failure, and that might not be a great model for co-op startups because you're, you're distributing a lot of failure among a lot of members. So it might make a lot of sense to get companies to a certain level and then start cooperativizing um, uh, and spreading out the, the, the risk more once it's, it's less intense. Uh, but, but the, um, yeah, I'll leave it at that, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's fine. It's very interesting, uh, thank you. About, um, about that, one, one of the issues is that if you wait um, the startup to uh, have success, uh, it will have such a, a value that if you share a value at that point, uh, people within the network won't get at a lot of value if they want to sell their shares. That's also one of the issues um, uh, about, um, I think, how should we share the equity with the network? Is it like a very hybrid model where you keep like a, a commercial uh, vehicle and then you create a cooperative on the side where you put all the people and the contributors of the platform but then they, they won't benefit from uh, having like, uh, created such a value within the platform. Or can you create like having your contributors being shareholders of your pla platform and also benefit from the value created by the platform? And if you want to do that, you need to do that pretty early within the, the company. Because if you do it too late, when if you do it now uh, with Uber, uh, the shares at a valuation of uh, 40 billion dollars, there's almost no chance that the, the shareholders will get money within the company. A good example is uh, about uh, Etsy. You know, Etsy gave some uh, stock options to their contributors, but uh, just when they went uh, public, but the company lost in valuation afterwards. So people lost money. They didn't get any money back, you know. So that's why we, we need to find a good time. And if you can do it, even when you're starting the company, if you get some shares, you know, reserved uh, for the contributors, maybe for later, that, that can be a good way like to build a capitalistic uh, vehicle with reserved shares. And then when you grow the company, you can distribute them to your contributor. It's a big challenge. If you want people to benefit, contributors to benefit from the capitalist model, you know, which is a bit different from building a fully cooperative model where you don't create uh, valuation with the company, etc. So two, two obstacles, right, to transform a platform or any company really into a co-op, well, a startup really, valuation and also shareholders, what, what they want, right? Because they might not be happy about this. Uh, Yasser, you wanted to react? Well, uh, I think it depends on the, um, the type of the co-op. Uh, in our case, uh, the case of the workers' co-op, uh, the, the biggest challenge for us is to, to stay uh, open to, to the outside. And we're working a lot on that because, uh, because we are only a workers' co-op. Uh, as we are strengthening the, the model at the as we are trying to strengthen the model at the international uh, uh, level, uh, we, we have to look what is around us uh, or it won't, uh, we won't succeed. Nathan? Well, I, I think also in, in, the, in terms of the question about something like Uber, I, I think there is a political question there, right? And, and I don't know the answer to this, but um, I, right now our politicians are kind of in a position where they can either do nothing or they can say no to uh, platforms that are really transforming the landscape of uh, housing and transportation and uh, uh, labor and a great many of other 
uh, uh, th things that they used to regulate and, and, and that they used to ha have some say over. Um, and I think that democratic ownership and shared governance is a vehicle that we should uh, develop as an option for policymakers. Um, maybe there are ways in which, in which uh, uh, political entities can help uh, ease that process of transition, help finance uh, some of these uh, 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 transfers of, of ownership to the appropriate stakeholders. And what this is all really about is that appropriateness. What is the appropriate form of governance for an entity uh, that has so much impact on our lives? When an entire cityscape is being transformed by an online platform, how do we build in the right stakeholdership? How do we make sure that the right people are at the table? Right now, they're not. They're just not. So you're saying that the public sector has more responsibility in there, or there's more uh, potential to call upon the public sector to transform more uh, corporations into co-ops, right? What about the private sector, though? Because if you see uh, startups like uh, Food Assembly, I mean, there is, there is a sense of responsibility here that we need to share value and power with the network that we have. So just an open question, you don't necessarily have to react, but I do have a question for you, Mark David, that's related to, uh, to, uh, to what Yassir said, which is very important um, in co-ops. As you said, Yassir, you are only a co-op of one stakeholder. So I was gonna ask you, Mark David, that you're talking really about the hosts, which is one part of your community, what about the farmers? What about the users? And does it make sense to involve them all or not? That's a good question. And, um, and just to go back like to, um, I think there's another complexity to talk about is um, all the, pl we talk a lot about the platform cooperativism, but the, all the platform work differently. If you, if you take Uber, uh, the Uber driver are, are like workers, you know, Uber would say, no, they don't have shifts, so they are not workers. But we just saw that uh, Yourself, uh, who is getting the money from uh, social contribution from for all workers, they just attacked uh, Uber and saying they are workers. So maybe some people take benefit also of the status. Uh, so Yourself is the social security uh, organism in France, yeah. one yeah, of them. Exactly. Um, if you look at platforms like Airbnb, like should people be uh, uh, shareholders, should it be a co-op? because people are taking benefit of, of a marketplace. They're renting their stuff on the marketplace. On our side, we are in, the, in the, the food vertical. It's very different. There's a big history of cooperatives. Like people are doing, uh, organizing a, a community together. They're organizing distribution, food production together. They're really working together to make that system work. They create stuff together. You know, not only I have my apartment and I rent it off Airbnb for myself, but I create something for a bigger community. And I think that's also, when talking about platform cooperativism, it's important to look at each vertical and see if it's working or not. What is the best model for it? And for us, we really like into that. So being in the, in the, in the food vertical, we believe, of course, we need to, uh, to have the stakeholders really involved in what we're doing. And the first stakeholders to involve are the host, because the host are our partner. They are the local people managing uh, the local shops, even if it's virtual shops. And what we see in like the traditional retail system, food retail system in France, is many have been set up as cooperatives. You know, maybe they change over time, but uh, in the beginning, like some of the biggest uh, supermarket chain in France are set up like that. So the hosts are the first people, and maybe the farmers, of course, because the farmers are selling on the platform. But f in a way, the farmers, they are selling on our marketplace and they could sell to any other marketplace. They are less uh, 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 stick, uh, stuck with the, with the platform. So the host for sure, maybe the farmers, the members, I don't know, they are clients. Should we involve the, the, the clients? It's a question. It's a big question, I don't have the answer. The host for sure, maybe all the stakeholders will have to decide. But we want to involve first the host in a governing body and discuss that, discuss that with them and see what would be the best option for sharing equity and sharing more governance with other st stakeholders. Mm. And th th this, this question presents some interesting challenges with platforms because part of what makes platforms so powerful is that they're often very low touch. You know, you can become a member very easily. You don't have to go to meetings. You don't have to worry about it every day of your life, right? You just use it when you want it and then you disappear, even if it's cookies track you everywhere or whatever it is. Um, 
and and so I think the challenge of finding the appropriate governance structures is really is really key, and and making sure that you don't have a problem where um, people are have governance power but are unaccountable to that power, right? So you can think, for instance, of something like uh, the case of of the Reddit rebellion a few months ago, right? Where where you had Reddit editors um, basically breaking the site in order to um, in order to raise a grievance, um, you know they they lose their, their, their playground in the process, but they don't really take a hard hit. And that's why I think it's really important to align governance with ownership and make sure that people who are, who are making decisions are people who are really gonna be accountable to those decisions and accountable for them and feel the effects of them uh, uh, in the appropriate way. Yeah, related to um, something that Yasir said as well, which is every co-op is unique, right? So it it feels like there's a relationship between the sector of activity and the idea or the interest of involving your stakeholders. So in the, in the case of the uh, you know, short circuits of food distribution, it, it does make sense because it's a community of people who are you know, involved in a better farming system, you know, ecologically uh, very, very involved. So it makes sense. Does it make sense to involve um, you know, other people than workers in the case of Group Up, for example? I don't know. Like, would I be interested as a client of those chèque déjeuner, uh, lunch tickets. <laughs> uh, would I be, be interested in that? I'm not sure. Well, um, it's maybe the next step. Uh, we are now really focused uh, on our democratic uh, transformation, international transformation. But um, we, we are thinking uh, of that. Uh, for instance, and uh, for uh, for example, uh, we have um, we have chosen to strengthen our uh, innovation process by relying on uh, on open innovation, uh, inve investing notably in some um, different funds uh, specialized uh, in startups, uh, for example. Uh, and we recently uh, won an important prize in France called Accelère, uh, and we are really, really proud of that because we are workers cooperative, really focused on, on our governance, and it's uh, an example and it's an illustration for us uh, for of our ability uh, to, to discuss with other uh, stakeholders. Um, it's the same because in addition we we are trying to get on board the whole community uh, through some um, co-development uh, initiatives with clients, uh, users, um, public authorities uh, and it's really uh, important for us uh, in order to to create uh, the new group and to to shape uh, what it will be uh, in the next uh, the next uh, few year, few in the next few years. So, in a word, um, we we want to be a cop for sure, but uh, in the right place uh, at the right time, but also with the best partners. And it's really important for us uh, in order to be really open to the world. Yeah. It's interesting to me, there's, a, there's really a question that I'd like to ask. We've been hearing a lot the words ownership and property, obviously, because that's the, the goal of a co-op, right? What happens to ownership and co-ops in a world where commons emerge, where actually ownership tends to be diluted because we all work and have our activities on global commons? What happens, what happens in that case, Nathan? Well, I think it's a it's a great question, and it's one that I that I struggle with a lot. I mean, it, um, there's a lot of overlap between, for instance, the commons of the open source movement and this effort around platform cooperativism. There's been great development in governance in open source. For instance, uh, look at the Debian constitution. You know, one of the major distributions of Linux has this whole kind of governmental structure built around it by the volunteers who produce that commons. You know, that runs my computer and most of the internet. Uh, it's an amazing thing. On the other hand, that commons, you know, is also used for profit by uh, uh, a company like Google to create Android, the most uh, fantastic surveillance device ever invented. Uh, and and so I think part of what we're um, trying to clarify 
uh, with, with these questions of platform cooperativism is where the value goes from our contributions. You know, one proposal, for instance, uh, developed by Dimitri Kleiner and the P2P Foundation and Michelle Bowens is this idea of a peer production license so that maybe co-ops could build commons, but they could license them in such ways that um, uh, only similar kinds of organizations can share them or can, can at least commercialize them. Uh, and that might be a model for helping to create commons that specifically support um, uh, shared ownership models. Um, others uh, insist that, that co-ops or platform co-ops should be creating much more open forms of commons. So, so I, I think an important uh, uh, point here is that we need to um, allow ourselves, I think, to critique uh, some, of the, some of the assumptions of the open source movement, uh, reconsider where that value is really going, and uh, try to create commons that are really uh, supporting uh, a broader range of stakeholders. Right now, open source is incredibly male, you know, incredibly white in the United States. Um, it's limited to um, people who tend to have particular forms of privilege. Um, and, and I think uh, uh, our hope is to create an economy of the commons in which much wider participation is possible, in which people are being rewarded fairly for it, and that value is not being extracted from that commons. Yeah, and I think I'd say one plausible scenario would be as well to see co-ops in certain sectors or in certain communities very, you know, close, and there property makes sense, a bit like the food assembly, right? And in other cases, like global commons, you would see the need of, uh, uh, you know, to the contrary, diluting the ownerships. Any comment? Yeah, Mark David? Yeah, um, Food is not a common yet, and land is not a common yet, and farmers need to make revenues, and they need to pay their loans, and it's very costly, and so on. So it's complex. Of course, you could say that maybe uh, the uh, uh, technological infrastructure we are developing could be a common at one point, but it's not a, what we're doing is not a simple um, uh, two-sided marketplace, and maybe that's the first step we try to commonize or make them in the blockchain. We have much more complex uh, platform with multiple stakeholders and all the, of the value chain, the food value chain to optimize. So I think first, we, if we succeed in our, in our first step of uh, really making the food value chain more uh, distributed, maybe through a centralized platform, because it's going in a way faster to do it. And we can do even trial and error and we can grow the platform. Maybe some people, or maybe yourself, at one point, we'll be able to make that a common. But it's not today. We'll see. <laughs> Maybe in the future. Any last comment from one of you? No? I think we can conclude now. Yeah? Okay. Fine. All right. Thank you very much. We're going to end now.